Good afternoon and welcome to uh, day two of the Eduardo Halfon mini symposium here at the University of Connecticut. My name is Avinom Pat and I'm the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies and Director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut. It's an honor uh, for me to be able to welcome you here today for day two of the Eduardo Halfon mini symposium which is co-sponsored by the Luis B. Ezaguirre Lecture Series, the Department of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, El Instituto, and the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut. Yesterday, uh, for those of you who were able to join us for yesterday's lecture, we had a fantastic lecture by Professor Marilyn Miller, the 2021 Luis B. Ezaguirre Lecture, on Eduardo Halfon and the Itinerary of Memory. And today's program, a conversation between Eduardo Halfon and Marilyn Miller will be a follow-up to yesterday's phenomenal lecture and many of the fascinating questions that were raised and dis discussed in yes yesterday's lecture. So um, yesterday's lecture was also recorded as today's program is also being recorded and we'll be very happy to share a copy of the recording from yesterday's program with you uh, after, after today's lecture. So you may see we will reference some themes that came up in Marilyn's lecture on the itinerary of memory, Eduardo Halfon in the itinerary of memory yesterday. We will try to explicate, um, but we would encourage you also to reference yesterday's lecture as well. So it is my pleasure to uh, welcome my panelists uh, for today, uh, Professor Marilyn Miller and Eduardo Halfon. Professor Marilyn Miller is the Seisler Professor of Jewish Studies and Professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Tulane University. She is the author of Rise and Fall of the Cosmic Race, The Cult of the Mestizae in Latin America, and Port of No Return, Enemy Alien Internment in World War II, New Orleans. Eduardo Halfon is the author of 14 books published in Spanish and three novels published in English with uh, a fourth, I believe, also on the way. He's the author of Mourning, winner of the International Latino Book Award and Edward Lewis Wallant Award for American Jewish Fiction finalist for the Kirkus Prize, the Neustadt International Prize, and Balcones Fiction Prize, and long-listed for the Penn Translation Prize. Uh, also the author of Monastery, long-listed for the Best Translated Book Award, and The Polish Boxer, a New York Times Editor's Choice Selection. And all of these works are going to be topics of discussion for today's program. So without further ado, it's a pleasure for me to welcome our two wonderful panelists for today. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation uh, between the two of you. So uh, I think we're gonna start, I'm gonna, there were so many wonderful things that were discussed yesterday, um, but I think we're gonna start um, by giving Marilyn the chance to, uh, to begin the conversation between you and Eduardo Halfon. Go ahead, Marilyn. Thank you so much, Avi. Um, wonderful to be here again with you, second day, amazing event. Thank you again for the invitation and to Eduardo for being present with us, albeit virtually. And uh, my first question is an easy one that came up in the, in the talk yesterday, but is still a, a um, query for me. Do you pronounce the H or don't you in Halfon? <laughs> that only seems like an easy question there. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the uh, that has an easy answer or not. Um, uh, firstly, uh, thank you, Avi. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Sam and Jackie, and everybody at at uh, UConn. Um, it, it's it's a pleasure. Uh, when we started planning this, it, it was supposed to be an in-person event, but circumstances as they are, um, we're online. Um, but that gives us the opportunity to, to invite a lot of people who are who are with us today and who were with us yesterday that are spread out all over the place. I see I see people from Guatemala even on the list. So, Halfon mm -hmm. or we say the H because it's not a Spanish word, right? It's not it's not a Latin American last name. It's 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 probably 
Hebrew or, or, or maybe even Persian. Um, the word, the word halfon, I think you mentioned this yesterday in your talk, um, seems to have at least two meanings. Uh, well, first of all, it's not my real last name, right? It's half of, it's half of half, half of my real last name. Uh, our original last name was longer. It was Atie Halfon, and the Atie was dropped at some point. We think at Ellis Island when when the great grandfather arrived. So my my grandfather's father. Um, but the original last name of the family was Atie. It was not Halfon. Halfon was what they did. They were what my father would say, cambistas. Yeah, um, which in Spanish is, is, a, is, a, is a very nice word. It means he who exchanges monies. You know? So a, a type of banker. Avi, is there a better word for this in English? I don't think so. I, no, I think that works. Yeah, yeah? But, yeah. but it doesn't work in what I'm, I'm, I'm about to say. So I, I, I grew up thinking that my name meant cabista. Uh, and I found out later uh, that it doesn't really. Um, the word halfon originally comes from the Persian, I believe, and it means he who changes lives, or he who, ch who changes life, his life. Aquel que cambia su vida. So, so not a money changer, uh, but a life changer, uh, which is a lot nicer, I think. Uh, no? Uh, or at least in, 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 in the literary world, it's a lot nicer. So not an easy answer, Marilyn, but I would pronounce the H. All right. In, in short. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, you were recently in Guatemala, um, and we have some people here, I guess, from Guatemala who are, who are on the call. So what, what, uh, what did you find and what, what does Guatemala mean to you now? Is it still home? Mm. What do you mean still? <laughs> ah, I can see none of these are going to be easy answers. No, 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 no. You should know that by now. The, yes, the, I do. Uh, let's see. There's, there's two parts. What did I find now? Oh, we were there for a month and a half uh, this summer, but it was the first time I'd gone back in two years because of the situation. No, the, we, we were in France when, when COVID uh, began um, and then decided to stay. So what, what should have been one year in France turned out to be two. And what I found was uh, more of the same, by which I mean uh, things that were bad before the pandemic are worse now uh, in, 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 in every sense of, of, uh, of that saying. The health situation is a disaster. Uh, COVID is rampant. Uh, hospitals are, if hospitals were, were, were bad before, now they are, they are um, even worse. Uh, so, so the situation that I, that I saw was not an optimistic one, but it's never, it never has been. It never has been. Guatemala is, is in, 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 in my opinion, uh, a broken country. It's, it's uh, the, 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 the levels of, of poverty have just been getting worse. The, uh, things don't get better. You know? Education doesn't get better. Infrastructure doesn't get better. Um, corruption, impunity, uh, the, the difference, just the, 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 the huge gap between the rich and the poor just keeps getting even bigger. So, so I am not an optimistic uh, person when it comes to Guatemala. I, I don't see a way out of this. Um, so when, when you say home, that's tricky because uh, yes, that is my home. Technically that is my home in, in, in that I was born there. I spent my childhood there. Uh, after, after the university, I went back there. I still have an apartment there. So, so legally, uh, technically, I am, that is my home. That is where, where as an accountant would say, I hang my hat. Uh, if I had a hat, I don't have a hat, but if I had a hat, that's where I would hang it. Uh, I pay taxes there, <laughs> but I pay taxes in Spain as well. 
and and in the U.S. when I was living there. So it's a very tricky question. I don't feel that Guatemala is my home. I don't feel that. I've never felt that. It, it's, it's not a feeling that went away. It's just a feeling that I've never had, even when I was growing up there. Um, so so a, a very complicated relationship with Guatemala. Very complicated. You know, I, I, I'm attracted to it uh, and repelled by it at the same time. Despite that, that ambivalence, which of course is a very Halifornesque trait, do you think it's important for your readers to know something about Guatemala, to, to, to understand something about the country, to be mm. able to understand your fiction? That's a good question. That's a, and that question came up when I was writing Cancion, specifically Cancion, which is perhaps the most Guatemalan of, of my books, no? because the story of my grandfather's kidnapping takes place in a very specific Guatemala, you know, in that in that time, in that in the, in the, in the 1967 Guatemala, um, and when I'm writing, I automatically assume that my readers are not Guatemalan, and it's just it's just a, a natural decision um, that I've always I've I've always worked from that starting point. So when I describe to my readers something, I'm assuming that they don't have prior knowledge of what I'm writing about. Um, and in this case, it was, it was the Civil War and how that Civil War started, you know? How, what sparked it in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, and, I, and, and, and I think, I'm going, I'm, I'm gonna guess here, but I think most Guatemalans don't know that either. Uh, mm. You know, if, if I would ask uh, uh, Guatemalans in the street, uh, how did the war start? Uh, who are its principal actors? Um, when did it start? I don't think most, most would have an answer. So, so if I want to tell a story set in a specific space, yeah, so, so to answer more generally, uh, I, need to, I, need to, I need to set that stage. Yeah, I, I, need, I need for that stage to be um, historically accurate. Yeah, even though the drama that takes place on that stage is a fiction, um, and we can talk about this, I'm sure we will, but, but the, the, the stage itself has to be uh, verosimil. Yeah, it, ha it has to be believable it, and it has to be, um, you have to see it. I think as a reader, you have to be able to see, think you're there um, in order for that story to work. If not, that story is not gonna work. So, so whether the reader is Guatemalan in this case or American, um, most Americans don't know the role the US played in, 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 in the Guatemalan Civil War. So I also have to, to paint that picture. Um, right. No? So that brings us to this question about translation and how most, I, I, I would assume that the majority of your readers actually know your work in translation. The majority mm -hmm. worldwide of your readers are probably um, people who mm -hmm. have come to your work. Is that, yeah. is that right or, or do you know? Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the math. Um, <laughs> probably just in sheer number of, of, of translated, right. um, of translations uh, to different languages. How many, for example, the Polish boxers in how many languages now? Oh boy, um, I, I I don't have a a, a, a number. I, it's like at least ten, like, right? Yeah, no, probably more like twelve or, or fourteen. Right. Um, yeah, I have to count. I should know that. I should know that. I don't. I don't know the number, but but yeah, it's it's a dozen or more languages. Um, so yes, if you do the math. Th that story, those stories have been read more in translation than in the original, in the Spanish original. Yes, that would be a, a good assumption, I think. And it, are there, do you have favorites amongst the translations of your works? Do you have uh, mm. translations that are, that are particularly significant for you? Yeah. Like the translation yeah. maybe to Kachikel or? Well, um, for different reasons, different translations for different reasons, yeah. Uh, the translation to English is always very dear, always, you know, because it's it's uh, it's it's my other language, and and I take it 
very seriously, too seriously, if you ask my translators, and you can because there's one here today, so you could you could ask if you wanted to. Um, I'm 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 too involved, perhaps. With, no, not with, without the perhaps. I'm too involved. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that after uh, my translators into English translate me, they they go off and work with dead writers, which are much easier. Uh, <laughs> Because I'm, 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 I'm. It's English, you no? Know? So, so I want that English to to be um, the sound, the way I I, I hear it in my head, you no? Know? And and responding, it looks like. She says quizás. <laughs> yeah, she's being ironic. It's not quizás. It's yes. So, English is very, very dear to me, um, for that reason. But you mentioned Cachiquel. Cachiquel was 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 a um, a way to to get that story um, into one of the many uh, Guatemalan languages. You know, uh, I I can't understand it. I, I I don't know what's happening in that book. Um, but it, it it was it was special in that sense. Uh, the French. The French. I don't know if you've seen the French edition of the Polish Boxer. The, the French edition is 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 uh, very special in in, in several ways. Uh, it's the shortest of the translations because it's only a two story collection. Uh, you know the 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 other iterations of the Polish Boxer are big books, you know, 10, 12 stories uh, or more. Um, the Japanese is is twenty stories it's a, it's a thick 300 page yeah and the dutch as well the dutch did that they included monastery mm -hmm. they included monastery in, in those editions but my french publisher who, who i love uh she said I, I i just want this to be about your grandfather i don't want the rest of the noise i don't want kalel i don't want the trip to serbia those are those for her were other stories that belong to other books i just want your grandfather so the, the French edition, I don't have one here, if not, I'd show you, is beautiful. It's a very small 40 page book of the Polish boxer, that story, and Speech at Bovo, mm -hmm. which is like the anti story, mm -hmm. which just destroys the original. Mm -hmm. And it was a great idea. And we published it with several photos of my grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very special edition for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So each, each translation has this, its, its own quirks. Those that I mentioned are the good ones. There are not so good ones, but we'll, we won't mention those. Okay. Um, what have you learned from these translations um, about your own work, about your, mm. your, your, your vocation, I guess? Yeah. You know what's incredible? Even though those stories, just to, to, sp to speak about the Polish boxer, because we could speak about Duelo or, or another one, but just to speak about the Polish boxer, still, after 14 translations and many editions in Spanish, translators will still find mistakes and still correct the original, uh, whether it be typos or just historical um, inaccuracies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, translators are so, they're, they're, they're so, they're such careful readers, you know, because they really have to get inside of the text that they read much better than proofreaders because proofreaders are reading the language, but translators have to not only read the language, but understand that language and carry it into another language. Translators are really good at spotting mistakes. Um, and I'm sure Anne would agree with that. Mm -hmm. No, it's a different type of reading. I've translated recently, um, you know, the, the William Carlos Williams stories and my own stories that I've been translating. So I, 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 I've, I've grown to understand how, not only how difficult it is, but the type of reading it requires. So right. translators not only will spot mistakes, they can also become architects of that edition. And, you, and I don't, you know this, you know that my books are a, a type of rayuela, type of hotspotch um, or, or hopscotch of, of one big book. So in, in every new language that they get translated into, we have to, to build that new um, 
world. You know, some publishers want small books. Some publishers, like the Japanese or the Dutch, want one big book. So we'll put that together. But the translators always work with me. So they become uh, yeah, architects. And I don't know what the right metaphor would be here, but they become, we, we work on how to present these stories to their readers mm. um, in, in, in a new way. Uh, so it's very interesting. So, in other words, um, Marilyn, in other words, I work very closely with mm -hmm. all my translators. Mm -hmm. um, not just language, which is the case in, in English or French, um, but in, in how we piece this together. I get suspicious when a translator, which has happened, uh, wants to work by him or herself. I get suspicious because there's some words in my stories that are very Guatemalan, for example, um, that require a little, a little, a little explanation at least. Uh, I just, I just like to be inside, so to speak. Designers, good word. <laughs> um, I'd like to bring this back a little bit to Connecticut, and maybe Avi can jump in here. Um, I at the ceremony at which you received the Edward Lewis Wallant Award for your contributions to Jewish fiction. Yeah. You talked about the stupidest question you'd ever been asked or what seemed <laughs> yeah. at the time to be the stupidest question, which yeah. was what are the two books that you have not read, which have influenced you the most? And you said, I've never read the Popol Vuh and I've never read the Torah. I don't yeah. want to, I refuse to yet. I know that these are the two main pillars of my house. Everything I am rests on those two pillars, my Jewish identity and my Guatemalan identity. But a writer must begin by destroying one's house. Have you still not read those two books? No, okay. no, I have not, and and I will not. I have, I have, I have. Now it became a, uh, you know, just a uh, a point of defiance. Right. Stop. I was going to say something worse, but <laughs> yes, a point of well, defiance. Uh, well, wait, well, wait, 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 wait. One reason I ask is that in mourning, and of course yeah. in the Spanish original duelo, you mm -hmm. it starts with a chapter and verse citation from the That's Torah. Right. That's right. Uh, Isaiah 56, five, I will give them an everlasting name. Yeah, so but it's not from the Torah. Read Torah, Torah why do you have not, this epigraph and what does it mean? It's not from the Torah. It's not from the Torah, Mel. Okay, it's not the, from the Torah, but it's from the- It's from, Hebrew, it's from the Bible. Yeah, from the prophet. Yeah, it's from the Bible. I, I, I'll read the Bible. Oh, you will read the Bible? Sure. Oh, yeah. okay. Ah, ah, so we're making a very Jewish distinction here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Avi, so, do you gonna, want to jump uh, in on that? You were you I'm were gonna, present in that conversation. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I will I will jump in and thank you. And I I uh, I just want to point out that uh, the context of the two stupidest questions that uh, Eduardo has been asked. I did not ask that question. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> that award ceremony. But no. I, I will I will mention one one technical thing, which is that I see that people are typing questions into the chat. And please, by all means, we will um, gladly take questions from the audience that are coming into the chat. Uh, in in a, in a little bit, we'll continue the conversation, and I'll bring in some questions that are coming in um, from from the chat. But if I can um, sort of follow up on, because I I also. Uh, want to bring sort of the two of you into conversation because there were so many fascinating points that you raised yesterday, Marilyn, Marilyn in your lecture um, that I'd love to hear both of you respond to. And so one of, one of the, the points that you raised, and I really appreciated this sort of organization that you did yesterday, Marilyn, around um, masks and thresholds and itineraries. And we talked about, and Eduardo talked yesterday about sort of the, the notion of identity and somebody coming to you and saying, well, you're actually writing about identity and a realization after many years of writing that, yes, I guess on some level, this is, this is what I've been writing about, but perhaps not, not necessarily consciously um, to begin with. But I, I do wanna ask both of you to address this question of, that maybe is, is partly in the masks question, but also in the itineraries and thresholds, the, the boundaries in particular, this sort of tendency to try to create labels, right? So, mm -hmm. and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but the notion of a Guatemalan writer, a Latin American writer, a, a Jewish writer, a Lebanese writer, um, and, and translation helps us to cross those boundaries, right? It's, it's so important in terms of 
helping us to cross those boundaries. And it seems like the project that you have undertaken, Eduardo, is very much sort of trying to, to deconstruct those boundaries, to break them down. So I wanna hear both of your thoughts on this. On the one hand, why do we constantly attempt to label? Why are we constantly trying to sort of put literature into certain boxes or anything for that matter into certain boxes? And as part of this project, trying to sort of think, have us think about the universal aspects of storytelling itself, right? That, that there is something that is incredibly universal that might be limited by language to a certain extent, but doesn't have to be completely limited by language, this, this sort of very human instinct to, to tell stories. Um, whichever of you wants to start. Marilyn? I get, I, yeah, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so, so the masks, I think, Avi, is also key here, you know, because the mask will allow you to move uh, from one through the through the threshold, so to speak, to 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 stay within Marilyn's language here. So, so if 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 we're moving from one place to another or from one language to another, yeah, uh, that mask can, can, can also be useful, I think. Um, so, and the mask for me uh, as a storyteller is, is important. Um, I don't know why, you know, the, 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 the mask, the mask can be, or, or we can use the, the word disguise, um, or, or, um, what's, what's, what was the other one I was thinking? I was thinking of a third one. Camouflage. Camouflage is, is another one. It's just a, a way to, to move seamlessly. Yeah. Or, or to appear, uh, to move seamlessly. Uh, so in, 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 in these stories that I write, you know, in, 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 in these places that I visit your itineraries, Marilyn, you know, these, these movements that happen, uh, or that this narrator, anti-hero, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that. I like the idea of, a, of, of him being not a hero, but we can talk about that. Uh, he needs these masks, um, these disguises, these, these, these other personas. Persona is a good word here, because he's, 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 he's and, the, and these personas or disguises can also be the name. No, the, the name that, that he adopts, um, or the nickname or surname. Um, yeah. Marilyn? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the, um, the first part of your question, which is, you know, why do we insist on label, these labels? Why oh, do yeah. we constantly keep trying to categorize people, put them in these boxes? Um, I think that there's, there's an upside and a downside to that. Obviously the upside is that it, it does provide people with a place of, a way of connecting with the text, a way of you know, finding themselves in the text or finding a resonance in the text for their own experience. Um, so if they're a Latino person or if they're a Jewish person or a, or a Central American person or whatever, you know, maybe any, any of those and all of those might, might help to provide that sense of connection or maybe just the experience of migration or uh, linguistic dissonance that you talked about in the, in the case of your own family, Avi. Um, I, all of those are, 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 are helpful to the reader in, in finding her or his place in, in the text. But I think there's the downside it is that we insist on these categories to the point where they then, um, you know, inclusion has has a dark side, which is exclusion. And Eduardo has talked about that in terms of his own, you know, experience growing up in Guatemala as a Jewish person in this overwhelmingly Catholic country. Um, so, so the labels are exclusionary, and you know, that happens in that story where the sister is saying, "You're not Jewish anymore because you're not practicing in a certain way." You know, right. so. Um, or the, or the taxi driver who, who says, are you, are you Arab or Jewish? You can't be both, you know, you can't, you can't include your, your 
your Arabic speaking Jewish grandparents in this equation kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a, a constant tension in yeah. one's work. Let me, let me, can I follow up, Avi? This sure. is, this yeah, is, this please, is go ahead. Uh, this is really interesting because what happens to me personally of, of, of trying to label me as a writer, now what kind of writer is, um, is he? Uh, it, it also happens to my books. You know, right. the, uh, the, 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 the type of, of prose that I write is very difficult to pin down. Uh, is it a novel? Are they stories? Uh, is it autobiography? Or is it fiction? So uh, ever since I started, I've been I've been labeled with different uh, either genres or subgenres. You know, auto fiction, meta fiction, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And and new ones keep cropping up uh, of of people's need to box to put you in a box. You no, know, to, to to where do you what, where do I put your books? You no, know, it's all, and this happens a lot with with publishers. Uh, because certain genres sell more than others. So it's a very commercial decision you know, to, to market my books as novels um, uh, rather than short stories. Yeah. Novels sell more, apparently. Uh, uh, but also right. it happens in bookstores. Where do I put his books? And this is the joke of my books being in the Polish literature section in Barcelona, um, uh, which happened. You know, it happened. So, so the same thing that happens to me on a personal level, this, this, this uh, attempt to name me yeah, as, a, as, a, as a writer, what kind of writer is he, happens to my books. Uh, and I welcome it in both regards. I am not bothered by this in the least. I want to create that confusion. I want my books to be unclassifiable. Uh, I will go out of my way to, to do that. Uh, I think you mentioned, Avi, yesterday, was it you or was it Mara? I think it was you, that one same book can be considered uh, best Jewish uh, book and best Latino book and best French book at the same time. And that I like. I like the fact also that some of my books have been uh, finalists or awarded best short story collection and at the same time, best novel. Uh, that, that I think is, is uh, uh, interesting, I believe. Yeah, no, you're, you're, it, you're showing, I mean, it's, it resists categorization, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's crossing boundaries in, in so many different ways, right? And I think mm -hmm. it's such an important part of, of this, this project. And I call it a project because in some sense, right, that all of these stories, which is one of the things that's so fascinating, all of these stories are interconnected right in in one way or another which is in some sense you know that you you have these different story collections where you have characters reflections memories that you know interact over time um and one of the things that and i would love to hear your thoughts both of your thoughts on this is is the way in which you write so marilyn you you have this title which you know itinerary of memory um and i think it's a I'd love to hear you say more about it because one of the things that I find so fascinating about reading Kalfon's work is the structure of the stories which sort of employ this process of association in many cases where, which to me as a reader makes sense in terms of how memory works, how maybe our brains work, how we draw certain associations between certain events. And, you know, I think it's in, in monastery, you see, uh, or, or the uh, Eduardo sees Israeli soldiers in a beret, and this creates an association um, between, you know, punk rock band where you were dressed in a beret, right? And so, but that, putting that in your writing, sort of that process of, of association, it's not just the itinerary of memory of sort of following family history and family memories. It's also just literally how our brains construct stories in a way. And I don't know, Marilyn, if that's sort of part of what you're getting at with the itinerary of memory, partly, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then um, Eduardo, your sort of reaction to that as well. 
Well, I don't want to say a lot because I want you to wait for the book, but um, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, re- I'm very interested in these like multiple functions of memory. So not just in this kind of traditional way of thinking of it, of either, you know, the, the Polish grandfather's memories becoming becoming a story or the memories of childhood becoming a story or the memory of a, of a trip to a, you know, to a, to a conference or to a concentration camp in Italy becoming my story, but also this idea, I think it's on the, I think it's on the blurb on the back cover of Cancion, or maybe it's in a review somewhere that says something like, you know, the author deals with his memories of his of his grandfather's kidnapping in 1967. Well, Eduardo Halfon wasn't born in 1967. He can't have any memories of his grandfather's kidnapping. All he can have is sort of like, you know, he can process other people's memories and he can he can construct from that, but he's he's not processing his memory of his grandfather's kidnapping. So I think there's this very broad, juicy, you know, mm-hmm way to think about memory in relation to how it comes into his works in multiple ways. And uh, I think that also goes to the question of, of genre and this, this, this idea that all Eduardo Hanfon writes is short fiction, he's committed to short fiction, yes, but in fact, um, he does write in things we might consider other genres. He writes for newspapers and he writes for, um, he writes for, Dicho um, hacia el sur, which is this text that that certainly seems like it's a memoir, and he writes for, um, you know, we we might even think of this. He he does his own translations, another genre, and we might even think of his participation in things like the um, things like the the book trailers that that you know. But before we get to the book trailer, let's let's have him respond to the to the other part of your question. Um, so memory. Mm. Yeah. Avi, I think I think memory is 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 the uh, clay of 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 the writers of writers. I think clay memory is what we work with. No, it's 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 our our um, nuestra materia. No, our our, our mm. It's, it's memory, but memory is 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 uh, not an easy thing to understand, um, or, and I think that's why it's so fantastic for fiction. You know, I think that's why it works so well. Uh, memory is not linear. Uh, right. It's 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 anything but linear. You know, there's ellipses within ellipses, and you just you go back and forth. Uh, Memory is is mistaken at times. Uh, memory is subjective. Memory is 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 liable to change over time. A memory of a specific event. You know, you'll you'll focus in or zoom in on certain parts of that and zoom out of other ones and even forget them. Uh, so so two people that lived through the same event will remember it differently, uh, and will remember it differently through time as well. Uh, and I find that absolutely fascinating, you know? And, I, and, and I'll work with that. So I'll tell you a story and then tell it to you differently uh, or, or retell it in another way or contradict the first way I told it. So, so it's, it's, it's almost a way of rep- reproducing the way memory works. Um, and I think mourning is a good example of that. Mourning is a text that starts almost unraveling through time. You know, it starts off in a lake and then it goes and you wind up somehow at Sachsenhausen uh, and then back at the Lodge Ghetto. And then you work back towards that lake. Uh, it's, it's, this, it's this way of, of meandering through not only um, space in this case, uh, different, different spaces um, and time, no? uh, but also that this this map uh, that is this our memory. Uh, in, in, in more specific terms, I will start, when I start something, when I start to write any new story, it usually begins with a memory. Uh, I'll, I'll see that memory as a photo, as an image, 
and I'll start just describing that image. I don't know where that's going. I don't know if that's just the, 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 the starting off point to, for something else, which is usually what happens. I'll start here and wind up way over there. Um, but I'll usually begin with the image of my grandfather's tattoo. Six nine seven five two. I even, I even. That's the way it starts. It just starts with the, the image of that number, blurry. You know that that old tattoo and his telling that it's a phone number. So that memory of, of childhood, that 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 joke uh, that he had, was the starting off point for something else. And that's usually the way I start. I don't know what I'm going to write about, but I'll start from somewhere in my memory even as in the case with, with uh, uh, mourning, it's a mistaken memory. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think that that number is really interesting too because it's not, a number seems indexical. It, it, it hmm. seems like something that there can, you know, like the, the meaning, the way that a number can contain meaning is very different. Yeah. Um, except of course, if it's a Auschwitz tattoo. Right. So, um, uh, Avi and I had a had had a an, a reaction to a, a something that that contains that number. I don't know if he's able to queue it up and sure. we'll see it as a group. And uh, we have some questions about it for you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share this and then we can discuss it and then I'll um, uh -oh. bring in some of the questions that are coming from the chat as well. So we uh, let me just do one second. Okay, this is coming from a YouTube video. You will recognize mm. what this is. Yes, I do. Steht a Wocher, steht und tracht, tracht und tracht, da ganze Nacht. Wemen zu nehmen und nicht verschämen, wemen zu nehmen und nicht verschämen. Tumbala, 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 laika, tumbala, 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 laika, tumbala, laika, spielbala, laika, tumbala, laika, freiler so sein. Mädel, Mädel, ich will bei dir fragen, was kann wachsen, wachsen und regen, was kann brennen und nicht auf Herren, was kann denken, weinen und trären. Tumbala, 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 laika, tumbala, 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 laika, tumbala, laika, tumbala, laika, tumbala, laika, freiler soll sein. Marischer Wocher, was darfst du fragen? Stein kann wachsen, wachsen und regen. Liebe kann brennen und nicht euch fern. A Herz kann denken, weinen und tränen. Tumbala, 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 laika. Tumbala, 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 laika. Tumbala, laika, spielbala, laika. Tumbala, laika. So I think we're both curious, Eduardo, if whose idea was this and um, where you got these people and why Tumba La Laika and, um, um, you know, the text in English at the end. So I haven't seen that in 10 years. I, uh, that was that was a little emotional because some of those people died in the last 10 years. And, and I haven't seen, seen it. I, I, Did you know all these people? Some, okay. some, yeah, not, not all, some. So the idea came, I don't, know, I don't know whose idea it was originally, but it just kind of evolved when the English edition was about to be published. So this, was, this must have been 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. And the idea I think was to take my grandfather's number throughout Guatemala. So for an entire summer, I traveled everywhere uh, carrying this piece of cardboard. And, and um, but what was interesting, Marilyn, is that how do you explain to an indigenous farmer that what this is, what this cardboard is, and I'm gonna film you holding this piece of cardboard. Uh, 
So what ultimately happens is that you tell your grandfather's story to everyone. Wow. And it was really moving. Uh, it was really moving. That's, that's all. I just remember the emotions of sitting down with people that I didn't know, most of them, uh, and staying with them for, for hours uh, before they did this photo shoot, this, this little you know, two second holding of the paper. Uh, and it, 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 it was very moving. Uh, so it's throughout Guatemala. It's not just yeah. Guatemala City. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And it was also my uh, traveling the country. Uh, yeah. I went to places I'd never been before. Um, so it was almost this, this, this short, you know, two minute, two balalaika <laughs> a video is, is a merging of those two books that I refuse to read, isn't it? it? It's taking the Jewish part of my identity to the Guatemalan part of my identity. Mm. Yeah, the video is a it's yeah. it's a really striking sort of juxtaposition, right? And yeah. it does it, and as you say, it, it I mean, I'm sure you for you personally it triggers emotions, but I think also, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's so interesting to think about reading your text, but then also to see a video, music, photography, right? And sort of the ways in which that can create that sense in a different way. So it's it's fascinating uh, to mm -hmm. see that. Um I do want to be sure to, you know, we've had so many interesting questions. So if you're uh, okay with it, I'll start to bring in some questions that are coming in um, from the chat. Um, and and uh, so Guatemala. So let's let's start here with a with a question that comes in from from Nareed, who says, um, "Is home always the place where your parents forced you to be born?" Um, and I'll say this is this is loaded. This is my mother asking this question. <laughs> so, um, you know, this so, uh, question so, of so, where so, is uh, home. Abby, yeah. what would be your answer since it's it's your mother asking the question? I, I know my answer. Yeah, well, I mean, there's you know, when you look at this in terms of how we define home um, and this where we what we call home, where our home is, is it one physical location? Is it you know, one of the things that I found so striking yesterday about the conversation is you talked about language and language sort of creating a sense of home. Uh, we talked about this term of mother tongue or mamaloshan in, in, in the Yiddish, but you also talked about sort of other languages becoming a stepmother mm -hmm. um, and which creates a, that's still a home, but maybe a different home, a different relation to that home. Um, I, I'll just say personally, I, you know, uh, my parents are from, from Israel, but I was born and raised in, in Houston, Texas. Um, but I live here in Connecticut, but I still at four o'clock today will uh, turn on the, the TV and check out the Houston Astros game because that's my team. Um, so, you know, it is sort of this sense of, of home which you can take with you and transport to different to different places. So tell us, tell us though to answer that question. I mean, what, how do you define that, especially as, you know, Guatemala, Florida, Iowa, yeah. back to Guatemala, France, I'll, Berlin. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give you. I'll give you an easier answer. Um, when I when I read your mom's question, I thought of my son. My son was born in Nebraska, but he's not Nebraskan. You know, he was born there out of pure circumstance. We were just there um, for other reasons. He spent the first year of his life there, um, but he's not a Husker. I don't think he'll ever feel any sort of attachment to Nebraska. I, I may be wrong, and he, you know, he'll he'll wind up a, a Husker in the future, but I don't think so. I think it was just um, his his lot, you know. Uh, so in in my case, it's a little more complicated because I was born in the place where I spent my childhood. So I think that that spending your childhood somewhere marks you, whether. I can I can I can scream and cry and 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 try to push that away all that I want. Those first ten years are really important and really, you know, they're really formative. Um, everything begins there. So I think in my case, uh, yes, but I, I don't think it has anything to do with being born there. It has something to do with childhood. 
although as you as you point out, I think in a number of ways, no matter where you're born or if you feel like some some sort of kinship to a place because you're raised there, you can still feel like an outsider yeah. in that place, right? So yeah. Yeah. Not they're not completely... exclusive. No, those right. two things are not are not are not mutually exclusive. You can you can, you know, feel that attraction and that repulsion at the same time or that, you know, um, outsiderness. Uh, even though you're th in there, you're there. And I feel that here in Berlin, you know, and I, I felt it in, in Paris and I felt it in Nebraska and I felt, I, I felt it every, in Florida then growing up, you know, um, just there, but not there fully. Right. Marilyn, do you want to add anything to the home question or before I continue with the more questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. You're good. Okay. Um, so Ron asks a question which, uh, harkens back to the discussion on um, translation or might have come in when we were talking about translation. Um, so Ron says, given the importance you place upon the translation of your works, both to the experience of the readers and to your unique exploration of identity and memory, how do you select your translators? Um, and, that, and maybe you could say something also about having a team that, that yeah, works together, a team of translators yeah. and yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So I don't select them. Usually in, 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 in a normal scenario, in other languages, um, I don't select my translators. That's, that's the publisher's uh, decision, um, usually not even consulted. I can suggest, for example, if, if, if I have a translator in mind, sometimes, um, as is happening now in Poland, uh, the books are being translated into Polish, and it was a translator who did the lobbying. So it was a translator, a very important translator in, in Poland who fell in love with the stories and then went out looking for a publisher and found one. So he's gonna be the publisher. And we worked on that together. Uh, but usually it's the publisher who imposes the translator. In English, uh, in English it was, it was serendipity. It was, it was, it, was uh, it, it began really, really like a party. Uh, it, it happened in East Anglia. Avi, where, where, where I went with, with Anne, you know, with Anne McLean. Anne McLean was the writer, the translator at the summer school. Uh, and I was the guest, her guest writer. So, so she was workshopping two of my stories. And Danny, Danny Han was the director of the school, of the, of the program, of the translation program. So while there, we concocted this crazy idea of having a team of translators. Uh, the Polish boxer, as you saw in the video, was translated by five people, which was crazy. Six, really, right, Anne? Although, although I, I was just the, the 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 pain in the ass. I was I was I was the pain in the ass writer who came and, and tried to um, meddle way too much. But the five of them, um, I think we talked about this in, in with Danny and Lisa, did we, Abby, a couple years ago? The way they worked, the way they worked this was really interesting. They divided up the book uh, in, into five parts. They each translated their part and then and sent it to each other. And then they uh, worked on the, the book entirely and then sent the first draft to me. And then I was involved with, with editing. It was really, really complicated, uh, perhaps too complicated. So, so the second book into English uh, it was just two translators, just Danny and Lisa. Uh, also the third book and the new book, the fourth book will also be Danny and Lisa. So, so in, the, in English, I will have the say just because I want to keep working with the same translators, but so does the publisher and so do they. So you, you become used to each other, it's sort of a, a, a team effort. But when a new language comes in, Ron, I am not even consulted. I'm, I'm, I'm the writer, I'm just informed of who the translator will be. And I have to trust, you know, I have to trust that the Danish translator who just turned in her translation uh, gets the music of it because I can't check that. I can't check if the repetitions are there, if, if the rhythm is there, I, I just have to trust. So uh, a, post, a postscript, I've written a sort of manifesto that I send to all new translators of why I do certain things. Uh, why I don't use quotes, why I don't use italics, why the repetitions are important um, as, as a drum beat. Uh, so I've, I, have, I have this, uh, you know, this one page text 
of, explan of, of explanation because I won't be able to see if they do it. So I want, before they start, I want them to understand why I do things. Uh, they're not gratuitous. They're not, you know, they're, they're, they're for a reason. Uh, can, you, can you say something about, um, just to follow up on the translation question, I think I recall Danny saying at that at the Wallen Award ceremony when we had this conversation about translation that it's the most intimate form of writing in a sense that um, he and the translators get to know your work and the way that you write and the way that you think, yeah. perhaps in a way that you don't even realize. Um, um, can you say something about what you have learned about your own writing from working with with the yeah. translators? Yeah, I remember Danny saying that. I, re I remember that, and um, and it's true. It's true because they get so inside the text. Obviously, they're, 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 they're they can see if they're good readers, and they are. You know? they 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 start reading you. Um, Eduardo does this uh, usually, and he thinks like this. Um, I think it's a shame he's not here. He should be the one to, to answer this. But uh, usually my way of writing is so spontaneous and so um, subconscious even. I, I'm not aware of the things I'm, I'm, I'm writing about, really. Uh, it, it takes an outside reader to point them out. You know, uh, I, I keep thinking of the ending of mourning. You know the, the ending of the story. Morning, the the lake scene. That 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 those final two pages that are so mysterious, uh, so enigmatic, uh, and I've had translators tell me their reading of those pages that I had not even thought of, and convince me that that that's probably what I was doing there. It was it's it's, it's just it's such a mysterious process, the writing process that that it takes other readers, whether they be translators or sometimes critics, or sometimes just a reader, somebody at an event will raise their hand and ask a question or point something out and um, look right into my subconscious. It, and it's, it's, it's scary and fascinating at the same time. Fascinating. Marilyn, feel free if you wanna add anything to uh, the, the translation topic. Um, I just want to ask one question. There was a there was a week, I think, when the translation in in Spanish and or the first edition in Spanish and French of Cancion came out together. Yes. And you talked about how they were read differently yes. in these two in these two contexts. And so I yeah. think there's also an interesting question here about yeah. publics, like how a translation yeah. forms a public that then yeah. absorbs that then receives your work in a different way, depending on yeah. where, where it is. That's so absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And it happened with Cancion. Difficult to talk about Cancion because the, the English readers haven't read it yet. Yeah. Um, hopefully that'll happen soon, but, but not yet. So Cancion is, is a book that begins in, in Japan at a, at a conference in Japan uh, of Lebanese writers. And from there, it goes into my grandfather's kidnapping by the guerrilla in, in Guatemala in 1967. So when the book was published in France and Spain at the same time, I, I was, I was uh, really surprised to see that the French critics and the French reviews focused on the Lebanese part. So, so all, all, all the, all the uh, uh, talking about and, 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 and writing about the Lebanese part of my identity and what that means. And the Spanish readers and critics and, and uh, reviewers focused on the Guatemalan Civil War. So the, the, the Latin American or Hispanic part of the book. And it was stark. It was really stark, the different ways of reading uh, one same book. It's the same book, but, but they come to it from what, two different historical backgrounds, you know? For the French, Lebanon, Beirut is more important. And for the Spanish, Latin America is, 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 is key. So yeah, and that happens all the time now. That's one example. Uh, my books are so pliable and they're so difficult to, to, to pin down or categorize that they allow for this. They allow for multiple readings at the same time, I think. Yeah, fascinating. And it, it, I think I think this 
that's one of the things about the translation and the languages and finding different audiences who, I mean, it's so interesting because you talk about your own process, but of course your readers are going to see different things and re themselves yeah. reflected in the text in different yeah. ways, which you can't control. I can't, no, um, uh, no. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna try to get to, to more of these wonderful comments that have come in. And I'll just mention Florinda writes in, and this was in a, when we were talking about categories and labeling, um, more as a, as a comment that even those tags, what is pointed at by the tags or the labels or the categories that, I, that we were talking about, those themselves are not simple univocal identities. Um, they are hybrid and complex in themselves, right? So Latin, Jewish, Guatemalan, Polish, all the sort of categories, 100%, um, yeah. Um, uh, Fernando writes, and you know when we were talking about um, or watching the video uh, of sort of taking the number your your on your grandfather's arm across the Guatemalan countryside, um, and Fernando brings up an important point, which is isn't there a continuity between the Holocaust and the indigenous genocide? Mm -hmm. That's what I think when I watch the video. Uh, Fernando absolutely. Rosenberg writes. So if you can absolutely. comment on that, yeah. Uh Absolutely, Fernando. That is absolutely true. And it, it happens a lot in my books that I, that I do this sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously that, that I equate the two. Um, and, and, and I don't think of the word genocide when I, when I do this. Uh, I think more oppression, um, persecution, uh, but, but there is a link between these two histories. Uh, it is not a coincidence that all of the people who appear in the video are indigenous. I made it a point to not include any Ladinos. So, so, so by Ladinos, um, white-skinned folk. Uh, so none of it is in the city. None of it was filmed in Guatemala City. It's all elsewhere because of this point you're making of, of, of the link, this strange link between the indigenous um, Genocide or the indigenous oppression and the Jewish. Yes, good, good, good eye. Yeah, I wanted to say that um, there are um, indigenous critics and scholars who have come under fire for using the term Holocaust to yeah. to to uh, in Guatemala to 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 refer to what happened, and in fact. Um, a friend, Estelle Tarica, who is from Berkeley, is writing is writing a book on this. It's going to be out soon um, on on the contentious relationship between Holocaust memory and the Guatemalan genocide or the Guatemalan Civil War. Um, and and some indigenous critics think that this is the third the third Guatemalan Holocaust. The first being the the European moment of contact. And the second being the 19th century exploitation of uh, Guatemala's natural resources, et cetera. So, so there, this is a very charged question. Very charged, and, and, very charged. And very important. And, and I come under fire, Marilyn, every time I'm in, in Guatemala and I use the term genocide. Yeah. So, so just to use that word in yeah. Guatemala, there's a very small, but very vocal and powerful part of the population who still denies um, right. that right. any genocide took place. And, and when I use this term, especially in interviews, uh, I will get pushback, yeah. um, even from Jews, who, sure. who still don't see that, that, that similarity. Anyways, complicated. It's, very, it's an open wound. It's still an open wound. This is the problem. Guatemala has not gone past that. Mm -hmm. uh, that that history, although it's it's now um, twenty five years since the peace accords, uh, that war is still so present. Right? There was no resolution. There was no healing. Um, so it, it's it's still very very touchy. Uh, there's a there's a comment here um, from Carolyn who who also sort of addresses this the interconnection between Holocaust memory or your grandfather's memory and the experience in Guatemala that she writes the video allows the writer to extend his grandfather's memory to spread it to a totally different part of the world, different but nevertheless a place where some of the grandfather's experience might resonate with the local community. Uh, 
I'm wondering if you can, you mentioned how sort of you went around and, and shared your grandfather's story and what the meaning of the number on the, on the arm was. Um, first of all, I'm just curious as to sort of what, what sort of reactions uh, you received in, in telling that story, um, both personally, but also reactions to the telling of the story in your, in your writing. Um, and, and also sort of this, this attempt to bring your own family's experience into conversation with this Guatemala and you know, the fact that they ended up in Guatemala, but they came from so many different places and they yeah. had all these threads that they brought with them. So tell us a little bit about that. What, what, what I remember most, Avi, is, is the sense or the feeling of communion. That's, that's the, the best way I can describe it. There was this coming together or this coming, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a type of communion uh, in the telling of my grandfather's story. So I don't know how much some of these uh, people grasped. You know, there's kids there, there's elderly uh, Guatemalans. I don't know how much they understood. Um, and with some, I went into much more detail because they asked for it uh, in explaining uh, what happened to him and, and where, where, where he was and how he survived and, and all of these details. Uh, but in every single case, there was a feeling uh, of sharing, of, 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 of coming together. You know, these completely or apparently different parts of, of history and different parts of the world. You know, a Polish Jew in rural Guatemala, uh, a World War II story in, in, in a village, a lost village in, in, in the Cuchumatanes. Uh, and so, so sitting down and just, just, Guatemalans are very, very uh, welcoming when you get out of Guatemala City. Guatemala City is a problem. But once you leave Guatemala City, uh, just showing up, just showing up, just showing up to their house and, and, and wanting to, to talk with them and, and wanting to share, um, just the feeling was, was one of, of communion. It was, it was very special for, for, for me and I'm sure for them as well in, in, in their own way. I'm going to um, bring in a, a question from Maurizio, um, who uh, in the chat, I think you can unmute Maurizio, um, in the chat writes, I have a, cop a copy of Le Boxeur Polonais and Monastère in French. <laughs> so go, go ahead, I think you can unmute now, go ahead. Maurizio. Hi, hi Eduardo, I don't know if you can see it, it's here. Oh, it's beautiful, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that photo, Mauricio, that's my great grandfather. That was my 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 grandfather's father, in, in that photo, and those are his two sisters. Uh, who who both all three of those uh, uh, they, they all they died they died the two sisters in the lodge ghetto, and the grandfather we think in Auschwitz. Yeah, and then there's another half of the photo that you're missing. Or do you have Senor Hoffman? No, I have I have monastère. Ah, mon monastère, monastère. C'est 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 très belle monastère. No, Senor Hoffman. Yeah, I can't see. Oh wow! <laughs> yes, yes. So, so the other half of that photo is in Senor Hoffman. It's a diptych that we published at the same time, and so half the photo is in one book, and half the photo is in the other. In the other half, it's it's my grandfather as a, as a teenager, uh, his mother, uh, Masha, and and his youngest brother Salomon, who appears in 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 uh, in day in in, in the morning. Yeah. Um, hi, so uh, I just briefly wanted to ask you, Eduardo, um, I'm, as you can see, I'm a big fan of your work. And um, so this that you explained earlier today about this um, attempt to be everywhere and nowhere at the same time, those are my words, you didn't say that, but I mean, avoiding categorization, uh, blending memory with fiction, with short story, uh, novel and so on. Uh, I find that very appealing. Uh, my question is regarding the fact that um, uh, sometimes um, I, I've tried, in fact, to do something similar, and I've noticed that um, I find some uh, blockages uh, when it comes to, even if it's in fiction, to talk about people close to me, like my father yes. or yes. so on. 
So yeah. uh, I wanted to ask you how you deal with this in the sense of <laughs> it's always fiction, but yeah. I mean, they, they yeah. can see some resemblances. Thank you so of much. Of course, of course. Thank you, merci. Uh, I'm guessing you're in France, um, no? Uh, so this is a tricky issue, Mauricio. It's, 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 you can ask my mom, actually, she's in the, she's in the audience. See how she reacts to being portrayed in, 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 in fiction. It's not easy. It's not easy with family members. Um, it's not easy whether they be dead or alive. You know, uh, in, in, in mourning, I'm talking, I'm, I'm writing about Salomon, this, this, um, my, father's older brother, or he who would have been my father's older brother, but who died when he was a kid. So I'm writing about him and his uh, memory and, and his legacy. And, uh, or in, in my other books, I'll write about my brother or my sister or my father, my mother, my, my Polish grandfather. Uh, so when I began, it was a problem. It was a problem. They, they didn't know how to handle it. Um, they didn't understand what I was doing, and, and I don't blame them for it. It's very, very strange, you know, because I would say this is fiction, uh, but it doesn't look like fiction. It looks, it looks like you're writing about me. Why, why do you call it fiction? Uh, so I understand. It's, it's, it's. I don't understand why I do, why I write the way I write, you know, um, so close to my to my life. But I think with the with with time. You know, with, with the books that, that started coming, uh, they started understanding slowly. Um, and I think my answer to your question would be that, that I always write from a place of compassion, um, love, although that's, hard to, that's a hard word to understand. My intentions are never negative. My intentions are never to out anybody to criticize anybody. Um, so it's, it's always with the best of intentions. I'll give you an example. Uh, so when I wrote this book about Salomon, uh, Mourning, I knew I was in trouble. I knew uh, this was a forbidden story. You know? I, I knew my father did not want me to write about this. Uh, so he arrived in Nebraska and I had written, I had finished writing it, and I said, I said, Dad, I'm, 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 I have, I have something to tell you. And he immediately went white because he, he, he knew it was something about publishing a story. And I said, I wrote about your brother. I wrote a book about your brother, and he said, Please don't, please don't. Uh, I don't want any problems with my sisters. I don't want any problems with my family. Please don't. His reaction was of worry, not of, not of scorn or, or uh, anger. And I said, I'll, 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 I'll make you a deal. I'll give you the manuscript. I'll make you participe. You can, you, can, you can come inside. I'm not asking for your permission. I'm going to publish this. But I, I want you to read it. And if you think there's anything there that is... Um, detrimental, if it, anything uh, out of place to the memory of your brother, we'll talk about it and, and, and we'll see what happens. And he read it and loved it and understood that what I was doing was rescuing his brother's memory from oblivion. No, nobody remembered uh, amongst the younger cousins. Nobody knew he'd lived. Uh, and that's, so I wrote it from that point of view, from the point of view of, of, of uh, compassion, no? So the intention, I think, that you're writing with has to be uh, not negative, not, not vengeance, not, um, you know, but, but brutally honest, brutally honest. And, and, and that balance is very, very complicated. Uh, I still have family members that won't talk to me. Because I, not because I've written about them, but, but because they consider that I make public things that should remain private. And this happened especially with the Polish boxing, with my grandfather's story. No. Part Thank of the you. price, eh? Yeah. And I think it, it's interesting. There's a, there's a question in the chat that 
that gets to this point also about sort of the the motivation behind writing the stories, but also the notion of sort of inherited family trauma. And I don't use that term lightly, but the idea that um, sort of, uh, Marilyn alluded to this also, right? How do you quote unquote, remember something you never experienced, right? The idea that memory can be passed from one generation to the next or sort of thinking about the process of how memory gets transferred from one generation to the next. And so the question asks, do you, do you personally on some level feel some, uh, I think it, it says relief from the emotional, um, relief from the emotional burdens you might have inherited from, from others. Yeah. Is, there, is there something, you're already shaking your head, so I'm gonna guess there's not something therapeutic at play Absolutely here or this, not. yeah, okay. I'd, I'd say it's the opposite in my case. I, I'd say I, I'm, I'm worse at the end than at the beginning. Uh, uh, you know, you, you wallow in this in this story for so long. Um, I think that 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 unburdening or that relief might happen if you write a, a, a quick short poem and you just get rid of a, an emotion. Uh, but when you're in this for months or years, sometimes, uh, no, no, and I don't understand it better either. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll approach these memories, Avi, to go back to that word. No, um, memories that I didn't see. I didn't see his kidnapping, but I didn't see my Polish grandfather experiencing the war either. Uh, so I approach them through a ver very personal, from a very personal and, and um, intimate point of view. So it's not m my Polish grandfather's story that I'm telling you. I'm telling you my vision of his story, my uh, point of view of his story. I, you remember the Polish boxer story. There's a point at, at the end where the camera shifts and you see inside the narrator and what's going through his mind as the grandfather reaches the dungeon in, in block 11. You know, and he starts trying to equate that emotion to one of his. And that to me was the key of that story. That's where I, I understood that I, was, I wasn't writing my grandfather's story. I was writing the story of a grandson in the moment he inherits his grandfather's story. So when I wrote about my Lebanese grandfather's kidnapping, it's not really about the kidnapping. It's, 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 it, it's, it starts there, but it goes somewhere else, uh, somewhere much more intimate. Uh, that's why I really liked, Marilyn, your, your first point yesterday about this narrator as, as not a hero. I, don't, I, I hesitate to call him an anti-hero, but he's not a hero. He's not the hero of these stories. He is perhaps the guide. Perhaps that would be a better way to describe him uh, with all his faults and all his uh, 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 insecurities. He's guiding you towards other heroes and other people's stories. Uh, they're, they're not about him in the end, I think. Marilyn, does that work for you? The uh, not the antihero, but the the guide who is taking us on this itinerary. I actually like the idea of the sort of um, bad boy positioning as a way to 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 fight against all these labels and categories and. Um, Florinda is right that the, that the, within any category, obviously there's diversity as well, but sometimes it doesn't, you know, in, in the world of publishing or in the world of marketing, sometimes that, that gets lost. So I'm all for, um, I'm all for pushback against those kinds of categories. Mm -hmm. And I, that, I'm sure that's why uh, Eduardo's work is so tantalizing to me. Continuous. One of the things that really long haul. <laughs> right. Well, one of the things that really resonates um, as someone who's interested in in memory from sort of the historian's craft and that idea of the relationship between memory memory and history is what I think comes through beautifully in the work is that all the memories that are received are understood or perceived through certain frameworks of understanding. So 
we bring to the surface the associations that sort of are at play in terms of when we when we hear a memory, it's not sort of a linear memory that comes to us and that's exactly how it happened. We have frameworks for understanding and associations that influence our understanding of the way it's received. So exactly in this example you provided for the Polish boxer, right? That yes, there is something that is told, some secret formula that is told for how to survive, but our understanding or the narrator's understanding of that story is shaped by the frameworks within which he receives that story. It cannot be otherwise. There's no sort of magic process to bypass those frameworks for understanding. Um, I do think I, that there, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Marilyn. And then I'll try to I'll try to get to one or two more questions and then we'll we'll wrap up in about uh, by by 130 or so here. So about five minutes. But go ahead, Marilyn. Yeah, I'm very interested in this idea of whether this memory work that that Eduardo's doing through the writing of fiction is is useful or not, is is useful in a in a moral way or a psychological way or uh, uh, even a communal way. Um, I, there's a wonderful book by a memory scholar named Dora Apple called Calling Memory Into Place. And in this book, she, she includes a lot of personal, um, personal experiences like her, her you know, uh, being with her mother to the, to, you know, at the end of her life, continuing, continuing to accompany her mother through the, through the, the end of her life. I think it's 101 when she dies. Um, and also her own personal struggle with breast cancer. And, and you're, you know, there's this kind of shock and horror at, at somebody revealing these very personal elements of their life. And yet I think there is something very instructive or, or healing in the whole process of revealing these memory journeys to the reader. So mm -hmm. I, I, maybe for Eduardo, these aren't yeah. avenues to better understanding, but perhaps for the reader, they can be. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I as a reader feel that more than I as a writer. So when I read, I, I do feel what you're describing and I do feel relief or, or, or empathy. Um, but not when I'm writing. When I'm writing, it's 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 something else. It takes place somewhere else, um, not not there. Well, and you referenced this yesterday. Also, the notion of the hard work that's involved with the writing, mm. but also the idea that choosing, or I don't know if it's choice, but that that the writing in Spanish and the work that's involved with saying I'm going to write in Spanish, that it really becomes sort of a, a labor. Right. Uh, nice. uh, I remember one year at a Wallent Award ceremony, I think we talked to Joshua Hankin, who was a Wallent Award winner, and he said, you know, I have to strap myself to my chair six days a week and sort of do this work. Right. And I have that image of of kind of the labor that's involved. It's not redemptive in a sense. It's it's work that you feel work. compelled to do. Yeah, it's, 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 it's work. Mm -hmm. um, OK, well. Uh, I want to get to a couple more questions here. So um, uh, Ron asks, what authors have been most influential to you in your own writing and why? Um, I, have to, I have to think back, no? Because that, that, that usually happens when you're beginning. So as, as like when you're beginning to play guitar, you, know, you, 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 learn, you learn covers and, and you learn... Uh, to imitate Clapton or Hendrix or Stairway to Heaven, probably everybody. You no, know? I, I think for a writer or for this writer at least, that's the way it happened. At the beginning, I was very, uh, uh, I was easily influenced, you know, and I wanted to be easily influenced by by all of these writers that I was discovering, um, especially the U.S. Uh, story writers, so short, short story, American short stories, uh, Carver and, and Hemingway and Cheever and, and uh, et cetera. And I think you can see that in, in, in the economy of my prose, the, the, the distilled prose. I think that, that's 
per perhaps that's where it comes from. Um, but but Bolaño was really important. Bolaño, uh, I've read all of the boom, of course. I read Borges and I read Cortázar after the Americans. So I come to, to Latin America after the, 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 the US writers. Uh, but when I read Bolaño, um, I didn't recognize Latin America in, in the boom. That was not, they were not writing about my reality. Uh, Bolaño did. Bolaño wrote about this dirty, uh, grimy, cosmopolitan Latin America. You know, he was writing for Barcelona about Mexico. Uh, that I understood. And that was really, really uh, important that, that, to see that I, that I could do that, that I, I could be a Latin American anywhere. Yeah. Um, Juan Carlos writes in, Canción seems to me to be the book that better portrays the story of your family as part of Guatemala's recent history. This has made me wonder about how you see yourself and your writing in relation to Guatemala's history. Any thoughts? It was a history that I, I, I ran away from for a long time. I didn't want to write about it because I didn't consider it my history. You know, um, when I was growing up in the 70s, we were so overprotected, so sequestered from what was really going on in the country. Um, we didn't notice until the late 70s when that civil war came down from the mountains and entered Guatemala City. And, you know, we started falling asleep to, 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 to gunfire and uh, kidnappings and, and my father had a gun. Uh, and then we left, you know, when I was 10, we left. So, so then I spent the eighties physically away from the war and the country. So it was, it was a history or a story that I didn't consider mine until I found a door, uh, my grandfather's kidnapping. Then the story became mine or my family's. Uh, and not only, or, or not, not especially, did I find my grandfather's kidnapping, but I found my grandfather's kidnapper. And then it became interesting. So Cancion, Avi, for, for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, was the nickname of his kidnapper. He was, he was called Cancion. Uh, and so it, it became, in, in a certain way, a story about him or looking for him uh, and his kidnappers, the rest of, 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 of the Guatemalans who kidnapped him, uh, which raises the issue of translation again, because how do you translate that title uh, if it was a nickname? So the French left it in Spanish. The Dutch translated it into Dutch. And we'll see what we do in English. Will it be song or will it be canción? We'll see. Uh, but yes, yes. To answer the question, in this book, I directly um, enter my family's place in Guatemala. Thank you. All right. Well, I there's one last question, which you can probably answer very quickly. Um, do you believe in cellular transmission of memory? And I think it's actually a, a deeper question about intergenerational transmission yeah. of memory. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the short answer would be yes. There's something that goes on at a cellular level, which, which, which we don't understand, of course, which is still mysterious. But I think, Avi, of, of these studies um, that have looked into the cellular transmission of hunger. Do you know this? Uh, so so mm -hmm. there's yeah. evidence of, of, of when a grandfather, especially two generations removed, lived through hunger, uh, that you, you receive that. And so your, your, your reaction to hunger or to food is different. It's, it's altered. So if that happens, why wouldn't memory somehow trickle down? Uh, and, 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 and maybe not in a, in a direct way, you're not gonna remember your grandfather's experience, but maybe the feeling of it, uh, the sense of it. So I would say yes. Really, really fascinating. And, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about intergenerational transmission of memory and food is always one of those, the interesting you bring up food, it's always one of those issues that you see it among survivors and then descendants of survivors, right? But thinking about, it's not just a learned behavior or something that's part of upbringing in a house, you know, the focus on 
not wasting any food or cherishing any food, but that it might be taking place on a cellular level. That's fascinating. And thinking about the interplay between those two things. Um, before we before we wrap up, I just, Marilyn, do you have um, any sort of concluding thoughts for the end of our two-day symposium, mini mini symposium on the work just of Eduardo Really Calzone. grateful for this for this time and this these wonderful questions, um, this participation from everyone on the Zooms as well, and um, I think we could do it again tomorrow and have as many. Interesting yeah, questions and responses as well. Yeah, so, thank you, everyone. I agree. I, I want to also thank everyone for for joining us. Um, there's a few, one or two last things here in the chat, Avi. If I can answer quickly, please. Um, go ahead. So Jackie says, "Canción, not song." I agree. Uh, I agree. Jackie, if, if if you look in the New York Review of Books, I published uh, uh, an excerpt uh, a few months ago, and they kept the title "Canción." Yeah. So that's that. You can read that. Let that be a harbinger. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and yes, Lisa, yes, Anne. Lisa and Danny are working on it as we speak, I think. Uh, we, have to, we have to turn in, um, I, th I think at the end of next month. So, so it's getting close. Uh, and Michael, uh, thank you. I would love to come to, to UCLA anytime. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good, well, this has been an incredible, uh, two-day symposium. Um, and uh, I really wanna thank my, my colleagues, uh, Samuel Martinez, director of El Instituto and Jacqueline Laws uh, from the Department of Literatures, Cultures and Languages for helping to organize both the inviting Professor Marilyn Miller to deliver this year's, what was supposed to be last year's, became this year's Is Aguirre lecture, really phenomenal. And Eduardo, thank you so much for joining us virtually uh, mm -hmm. from Berlin. So happy we're able to make this work. Yeah, let's have a virtual round of applause. Um, For everyone. Yes, really phenomenal. Thank you so much, everyone. And again, this program has been recorded. Um, we will share the link to yesterday's lecture and today's uh, conversation after the program. But thank you everyone uh, for being here and be well, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank, Thank you. you. Be well. Be well.